the most liberal cities, which are also the densest and the most diverse, but the cities that vote the most for progressive mayors or vote the most for candidates like Obama or Clinton are the most unequal. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I'm going to examine the places where economic opportunity is, where it's not, and why the idea of American meritocracy has serious flaws. And helping me parse this out is one of the world's leading minds on cities, Dr. Richard Florida. If we want an economic strategy, if we want an industrial rebuilding strategy, if we want an economic and technological strategy of the future, it has to be rooted in building and rebuilding our cities. And then the G Zero team will hit the streets to see how income inequality plays out in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country, the South Bronx, which sits within view of some of the priciest real estate in the nation as well here in Manhattan. Now that I have kids, now that I've come back to the Bronx, I really can't imagine myself or my kids like really growing up anywhere else. I've also got your puppet regime. But first, a word for the folks who help us keep the lights on. Richard Florida, great to be with you. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. You are sort of the legendary urbanist. You know everything about cities. One of the things that I guess I should kick off with is that when I see where cities are going, it seems pretty parallel to this growth in global inequality at the individual level. Is there such a parallel? Is that, is that, are they linked? Well, I actually think that cities magnify, have magnified inequality. If you look at the inequality of nations, generally speaking, it's gonna be higher in superstar cities because of the obvious reason. Those superstar cities, those big cities, those capital cities. New York, London, Hong Kong. Of course, they attract super talented, super ambitious people. Uh, one, those people just make more money if they have a college degree or they're professional workers. But two, they tend to attract people who do things that make a lot of money. Finance is very concentrated in these cities. Technology now, media. So yeah, and then, and then of course, cities also, at the other end, tend to attract people who are coming off the farm or immigrants coming in from other countries. So they tend to amplify inequality. The only other thing I would add, though, and, and something that I think I've tried to make the case for, is that we talk about economic inequality a lot. We don't often talk about geographic inequality or spatial inequality, the inequality between not just individuals or classes of individuals, but types of places. And I think really this geographic inequality, when we look at political instability, the rise of populism, backlash politics, I think that has a lot to do, it's not just economic inequality that's driving that, it's the spatial inequality, the separation of different groups of people and different classes of people into different geographic communities. One thing I find very interesting is this notion that, you know, you've got to move if you want to have an opportunity these days, right? I mean, you know, your second tier, your third tier cities don't necessarily make it for you. And a lot of people are very rooted to where they grew up, their sense of family, their sense of belonging in communities. Um, First of all, do you think that that is one of the most dramatic uh, of, of drivers of, of inequality right now? And to the extent that you do, do you think there's anything that can be done about it? It's a big, big question. And it's something that I've been interested in for the better part of two decades. In a book I wrote called Who's Your City, I mm -hmm. actually separated yeah. people into three different classes. The mobile, people who are ready, willing, and able, and have the, person, have the income, the background, and the personality characteristics they tend to be very open-minded, open to experience people who are able to move to opportunity. The stuck, people who don't have the income, don't have the wherewithal, are kind of just stuck, you know, underprivileged, disadvantaged people. And then the rooted, I think that's the term you use. People who are rooted to friends, rooted to family, rooted to community. I think that pretty much describes it. And, and you know, we're now, just now, starting to see good research on this. Now, one thing that you write about, which I hadn't appreciated as much, is that the real growth in poverty in the United States right now is in suburbs. Not in urban centers, not the rural areas, it's in suburbs. Um, that's a change. Why is that, I mean, when I was growing up, everybody was like, that's where the wealthy people were going. I mean, you know, I may not have been one of them, but you aspired to that, right? Why, why is that changing so much? So people have called this the great inversion. The inversion that in the old days, the old urban crisis, I grew up in Newark, uh, the cities were emptied out of the middle class, emptied out of jobs, and left with disadvantaged and low-income people trapped in a cycle of poverty. 
What seems to be happening now is cities revitalize as tech companies, headquarters companies, talented, highly educated, uh, college educated people, the creative class move back to cities and schools get better, right? And families start to migrate in. Um, there's no more room. So low income people get pushed into the suburbs. Still, I think the poorest people and the most disadvantaged people live in the urban core. But poverty and economic disadvantage is growing much faster. And a larger number of, because suburbs house more people, a larger number of poor people and the, the growth is much faster in the suburbs. The way I like to think about this is that we have to get beyond these words city and suburb. I kind of like to use the word patchwork, a patchwork city, a patchwork metropolis, where you have these I'm little, not sure that's gonna catch on, just yeah, so you know. Yeah. Uh, little globs of concentrated advantage mm -hmm. in the city and in the suburbs, surrounded by much larger spans of concentrated disadvantage. What's the problem though is the middle has disappeared. You know, in the year 1970, about three quarters of Americans lived in middle class neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now about a third of us do. So we've, we've divided our society into rich and poor, areas of advantage and disadvantage and the middle's dropped out. In the old industrial economy, it was the factory and the large industrial corporation that org was the organizing platform of the economy. In the knowledge economy, we know, in the global knowledge economy, the city is the place that organizes the factor of production. It matches talent with capital, with innovation. It's the place where innovation is occurring due to density and diversity. These technologies, these new urban technologies are about making the city run more efficiently. So I actually believe these urban technologies are the most important growth wave of all innovations mm -hmm. in the modern global economy. And most people say what autonomous vehicles will do is reduce traffic that never happens. We build more lanes and there's a basic law, the more lanes you build, the more traffic comes. Uh, but also they say, well, it's gonna enable people to avoid the congested city and move out to the suburb or rural area. I think what autonomous vehicles do is enable the world, cities to push poverty further out to the periphery. So you won't be driving to work in your uh, autonomous car. There'll be autonomous buses and micro buses. Mm -hmm. the, and, and low income people will be pushed, for, the great inversion will get even greater and poor people will get pushed further out in the periphery and more affluent people will colonize. Because it's plausible for them to then go two hours each way and it's very it'll, easy and efficient It'll to look it. like a European or Latin American city with rich people at the core and poor people pushed out in the periphery. That's my hunch. I don't, no one can, it can really predict this. My hunch is the advantages of the urban center for talent, for productivity, for innovation, for capital, will be magnified and autonomous vehicles will, will widen spatial inequality. Now, you're an urbanist. You talk about suburbs. Maybe not surprisingly, you don't talk a lot about rural areas, places that, you know, it's the red wave, it's Trump's support base in the United States. We see this in Canada too. Um, are they just gonna be further left behind in every way you're thinking about this? So rural areas are really fascinating because we've now begun to do a lot of research on rural areas. Um, there are about 100 rural places in the United States that are attracting the creative class like all get out. The, the ones New Yorkers would know are like Hudson, New York, rural places in California or Colorado. And in the way I look at this, I know it sounds crazy, but if you go back and look at the United States history, particularly the 50s and the 60s, there were a lot of creative people that were already migrating back to the rural areas. The whole hippie movement was about going back to rural areas. So I think there's something in the world that pushes some people to rural areas, but, but that means about 100 of them will mm -hmm. do well. Yeah. And we have hundreds and thousands of them. So we have a situation where a relatively small number of cities, a larger but still relatively more small number of suburbs, and also a relatively small number of rural areas are doing well, when large spans of cities, suburbs, and rural areas decline. And I think that's the agenda. How do you try to help the large numbers of urban, suburban, and rural places that are really struggling? You've lived in a hell of a lot of cities over the course of your life. Who's getting it? Leave aside the big ones. Leave aside New That's York. The hard who, part. who in the second group, places you might not pay that much attention to, a lot of our uh, viewers probably haven't been there. What are some places you think are really getting it right right now? So I, I don't think any place is getting it right. I do think that large cities like New York and London are, have been blessed, and, and people will say this is crazy because they've had all sorts of problems with mayors with good governance, that these cities have developed nonprofit infrastructures and public-private partnerships and thoughtfulness outside of just local government. And I think they do pretty well. That's why partly they've been so resilient and be able to stay large. I think what cities have done really well is urban revitalization. You could go from Pittsburgh to Detroit 
even Newark, remember Newark, my hometown was an Amazon HQ2 finalist. Mm -hmm. It was one of the 20 finalists. Tulsa, Oklahoma, I could go down the list of all of these small cities, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, there's Dow so Dallas. Da yeah, oh, yeah. Dallas has done fantastic. Incredible, yeah. Houston, Austin, yeah. San Antonio. I think that cities, and I think my work and the work of my colleagues, my peers, have been very important. We developed a series of, of narratives, a series of theories, and a series of tools. Cluster analysis. How do you focus on the clusters of industries, the kinds of talent, quality of place? How do you make your place more attractive? Yeah. We worked with mayors and councils and economic developers. What we haven't done well is mitigate inequality and unaffordability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the next generation. And there I would say cities have not done well, and until recently, not been cognizant. There's been such a focus on reviving the urban center, on, on bringing people back, that, that cities haven't stopped until this recent moment and said, oh, oh, wait, we have a problem, and that the gains of urban revitalization are going to an advantage group. And a disadvantaged group is being left behind. That's the next is, agenda. Is San Francisco the single biggest example of this in the world today? Yeah, and and you because it, it feels it's crazy. But you look at it. How to see? You know, one of the things I talk about in the new urban crisis is we ran this silly correlation analysis. The most liberal cities, mm -hmm. which are also the densest and mm -hmm. the most diverse, but the cities that vote the most for progressive mayors or vote the most for candidates like Obama or Clinton are the most unequal. They're the most unaffordable. They have the highest housing prices. So I think that's what's happened is in these vibrant superstar cities and tech hubs, they've attracted highly educated people that have moved there. And that's driven up housing prices because housing's scarce, we know yeah. this, and, and inequality because those people have more money. But are they also driving much more NIMBY policies, not in my backyard? Well, I mean, <laughs> this is the big new agenda for policy, and I think they're split. I think they're incumbent homeowners that tend to be NIMBYs because they want to protect their property values, but young people who aren't homeowners tend to be YIMBYs. NIMBYs not in my backyard, YIMBYs yes, yes in my backyard. In my backyard yeah. And I think that's sort of a political, someone told me, uh, a political scientist at Stanford I talked to the other day, told me NIMBY versus YIMBY is the number one most significant issue in California. More than anything else. So that's telling you something about housing prices. Mm -hmm. The point I want to make though is that even the most progressive politicians the most progressive mayors on the planet have not been able to make a real dent in this. And that's why, because I think city policy can't do it. One, I think there's a big national dimension to this. We have now the studies that show a lot of spatial inequality is the result of national level characteristics. Mm -hmm. But two, what has rebuilt our cities is not city policy. It's, it's the role of so-called anchor institutions, large universities, large medical centers, progressive companies that have taken an interest in their town. What is happening now is those anchor institutions are starting to hear the message, hold on. We can't just develop housing for professors and doctors. We can't just pay our top talent high wages. We need to develop more affordable housing for community residents. Mm -hmm. We need to develop more affordable housing for our service workers. And you know what? We employ a lot of service workers. We have to figure out a way to raise their wages and make them more productive and give them better career paths. So that's, that's a change that's happening right now. Bridget, Florida. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure being with you. I probably don't need to tell you that New York City is one of the wealthiest places on earth. There are hundreds of thousands of millionaires in this city and even a few dozen billionaires, some of whom own apartments in those high-rise residential towers behind me. But just a few train stops away from here, there's a very different reality that's also part of New York City. All right, we just got off the two train here at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, an area known as The Hub in the South Bronx. And you know, 40 years ago, this was one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in America. Since then, the turnaround has been remarkable with new investment, new housing, and economic opportunities. And yet still, this congressional district has the highest poverty rate of any district in the United States. And we're about to go talk to some people who are trying to change that. My name is Allison Crawford. I'm CEO at Room to Grow, a nonprofit organization. We work with families with children aged zero to three. And welcome to our new flagship location in the South Bronx. We are currently building it out and opening our doors in January 2020. We do three primary things, parent support and coaching, material goods for the babies. So that includes books, toys, clothing, and equipment. And then the third thing we do is make connections to outside resources. So whether a family is facing food insecurity or housing insecurity, we try to make connections that work so that we're able to support long-term family system stability. What's the biggest challenge raising kids in this community? Ah, the drugs. <laughs> 
Oh gosh. Trying to find a good school here is terrible. My commute is the hardest part of my day. What's the easiest part of your day? What's the best part of your day? Coming home, getting back home, which is not easy as well. You know, some of us don't have um, the privilege of having people support us. Some of us don't have the privilege of having, you know, the financial needs for, to have a child. And that happens a lot within this community. Most of the people are living on minimum wage. So you don't see that increase in income. It doesn't match the, um, the, the living expenses that, that comes with living in, the, in New York. I mean, not just in the Bronx, but in New York City as a whole. It does suck that in the beginning of my life, if I had just a little bit more money, my kids' life would have been a lot easier and my life would have been a lot easier. But then at the same time, it builds such resiliency inside of me and in my kids. I don't hear people that I live around in the Bronx talking about buying, buying buildings. People are kind of just looking for a place to lay their head. I think that everyone that you see walking around here, it's fighting to get those opportunities. And you know, hopefully, you know, that's part of what Room to Grow does. Like they're giving our kids and us as parents the opportunity to not be another um, statistic. The level of like national self-reflection that it would take for us to really move the needle on macro inequality is something I can't imagine in my lifetime, unfortunately. Um, but I have hope because there are definitely pockets of thinking about this that very brilliant people are doing and there's good work on the ground, like what we're doing here at Room to Grow. And the more that we can incorporate the community's voice as we amplify these issues, the better. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's still true? It is. If you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, that's true. Oh yeah, I think we're built strong and resilient. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, there's challenges everywhere, but it's just like over here is an everyday thing. Yeah, it's super unfair that those people over there on the other side have more and can do more with their money, but the people on this side are so much more resilient. If you could go through all those things and, and having to take care of a child, being a parent, go to school, go to work, and survive in New York City, you could survive anywhere else. Surf's up, losers! Tucked away in the secret place where the ICBMs grow It's a little slice of paradise that I want you all to know On some calm or coastal region, yeah, it's got the wavy sound The breeze is blowing, the surf is up, the artillery is ordered out That's our show this week. That's it, there is no more show this week. The show this week is over, finished, kaput. But if you come back next week, there'll be another show. It's extraordinary, that's the way we work every single week, so don't miss it. And if you like what you've seen, check us out at gzeromedia.com.